The Tom Woods Show, episode 826. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Folks, if your email inbox is taking over your life, manage it with SaneBox.com. Check out SaneBox.com slash Woods and get a two-week free trial plus an automatic 25 smacker discount. Hey everybody, Tom Woods here, and I'm here with Murray Sabre, and I'm actually here at a resort with him. He's in Kissimmee, which is not far from where I live, so we're doing this in person. How about that? I think I've had about three interviews I've done in person in 826 of these. I wanted to talk to him as long as he was in town about what's going on, what we can expect with Donald Trump being inaugurated in several days, uh, several days from now. What can libertarians maybe hope for under Trump? What should they be watching out for? And maybe say a little something about New Jersey politics where Murray is something of an expert and indeed a participant himself. But Murray has been a professor of finance at Ramapo College for 32 years. He's currently on sabbatical working on a very important project that I know you're going to be interested in, so we'll talk about that. But uh, for now, I'd like to welcome Murray back to the show. Murray, thanks for being here. Thank you, Tom. It's great being with you today. All right. Let's get talking about I'll hand you the mic. It's very low tech when I've got an extra per I'm so not used to having an extra person. I have one mic and I just hand it to the person. Anyway, we got Donald Trump being inaugurated. He is a wild card in a lot of ways. My friend Scott Horton has this rule. He calls it Horton's Law, that when a politician makes promises, you can be sure he'll keep all the bad ones and abandon all the good ones. But leaving aside Horton's Law... Let's think about the rosiest possible scenario. What would be a Trump presidency that you would look back on and say, all right, he wasn't a libertarian, but I'm glad he did A, B, and C. What would A, B, and C be? Well, Tom, uh, looking at Trump, who would have thought a year from now we'd be talking about a Trump presidency in just a few days? That's just an amazing phenomenon, uh, given the fact that everyone wrote him off. But having said that, he's going to be in the White House in a few days. And so what we can expect, I hope, is that he diffuses international tensions. Now, that's going to be hard given the foreign policy team he's assembled. He's assembled people who have made some pretty aggressive statements in their testimony to uh, the committees that, that they're testifying before regarding their nomination to be Secretary of State and Secretary of Defense. So if he can diffuse tensions with Russia, diffuse tensions with China, uh, not engage in a trade war with China, which would be very important because if we have a trade war with China. Some people think this is, can be a repeat of the 1930s where the trade wars, some people think, uh, helped trigger World War II. Now, if we do have a trade war with China, hopefully it will be very short and be over with when people realize that uh, trade wars will not do anything but uh, create conflict and tension and lower the standard of living of the American people. And so what we can hope for in those areas is that Trump realizes that um, you've got to have freedom, free enterprise, uh, international trade, international cooperation, and, uh, and try to do something about the Mideast as well. He's talked about uh, defeating ISIS. Well, we've tried that, and it has, so far hasn't worked too well, but uh, we've got to make sure that the Mideast uh, does not draw us in any further. We've spent trillions of dollars, all of which have been borrowed from the uh, from uh, uh, savers around the world to fight what has been a quagmire in the Middle East. Nothing's been resolved. Uh, how many American troops have been killed and maimed? How many um, people from Iraq, Afghanistan, innocent people have been killed? Uh, the Mideast has been a place that people have warned about for centuries. Don't get involved in the Mideast because it's been the, um, it's been the uh, graveyard of uh, countries like Britain and the Soviet Union. And so uh, we can hope in that area that Trump does something pretty remarkable, namely say that uh, this interventionist foreign policy has been a failure and we should try cooperation rather than conflict and intervention. It was hard to know, and of course it's still hard to know, whether Trump would continue with his very confrontational style even after uh, he was elected. And yet he has basically maintained that stuff. I, I was thinking that maybe after he was elected, he'd tone it down. And then part of toning it down would be walking away from some of his earlier positions. Now, there's maybe been a little bit of that, but not nearly as much as people might expect. And I've – like for instance, just recently he had his first press conference 
and we we all know the confrontation with Jim Acosta. He looked right at him and said, "He Jim wanted to Acosta wanted to ask a question. For, he's he's a CNN reporter, and Trump looks at him and says that he's not getting a question. He says your organization's terrible, and then protests and and Trump says you are fake news to CNN, which of course is true, and you can look." On down the line, is there, a, is there a war they haven't misled us about? I don't know I, I, if there is. Is there, a, let's say, a high-profile crime or interracial crime that they haven't misled us about? I don't know what it is. I mean, they're on down the line. They have given us uh, propaganda over and over. So, you know, I cheered that. I was happy when he called CNN fake news. Now, but another thing beyond that, maybe you can get your comment on that in a minute, but I recently spoke to a couple of people who know Betsy DeVos. They know the DeVos family. Now, she's the nominee for Secretary of Education. And I thought the left was totally overreacting when they said, oh, she's an opponent of public education. She'd be the worst possible person. I thought, look, these people get hysterical about anything. They'd, they'd be hysterical if he appointed Bob Dole. you know. So I didn't think it was a big deal. But these people assured me, yeah, okay, she likes school choice in a way that I don't really like it. But they say, actually, she is kind of an opponent of – of public school. So it kind of makes me feel like uh, maybe we somehow managed to sneak in a, a decent one. Is that possible? It's always possible. You just never know until people get into office and uh, implement policy. And uh, the thing that we have to watch about Trump is he seems to think he's the CEO of the American economy instead of president of the United States, whose job it is to defend uh, the Constitution, the American people's rights. So that's where I think the wild card is. If he thinks that he can micromanage the U.S. economy and that his role as president is to, quote, protect American jobs. That's not the role of the president of the United States. Ron Paul didn't say uh, is, the president is supposed to protect jobs. No libertarian says the role of government is to protect jobs. The role of government is to protect rights. That's what <laughs> limited government is all about. Unfortunately, Trump, as a CEO of uh, his organization, thinks that he can micromanage uh, the U.S. economy, which, again, is another example of what Hayek would call the fatal conceit, that he can make he can have good outcomes by badgering people to stay in the United States, even though it may be in their self-interest, to build a plant overseas. But we'll see exactly uh, what happens as the um, 2017 unfolds and we go into uh, 2018. But it's going to be a rocky political uh, environment given the press's hostility to Trump. And I've never seen anything like this because the press usually treats a president or president-elect with some element of respect that even though they may not like him, there's an there's a protocol that you have. You don't badger the president of the United States in a press conference. You are called upon, and if you're not called upon, sit down and behave yourself. Show some courtesy. I mean, it's appalling um, the, what's happened. And and then I don't know if anyone has said this on your show or in, uh, in the media but general. You know who I blame for the tenor of this campaign and what's happened? Megyn Kelly. If people recall... The first question out of her mouth in the first Republican debate during the primary was about Trump's view of women. And she made a statement that I found such appalling about what Trump allegedly said about women. And that set, I think, the tone of this campaign. Instead, the question I would have asked if I were in that position was, Mr. Trump, everyone on this stage has held political office, either as a governor or a senator or a current senator, and you would be the first president since Dwight Eisenhower who never held political office. What makes you qualified to be president? If she had taken the high road and asked that question, I think we would have had a much different Donald Trump. I think so. But we will never know because I think she really poisoned the atmosphere in American politics by asking that question about some personal remarks that he may or may have not made in the past. So that's why when I first saw Megyn Kelly on TV, and I only saw her recently, I was appalled the way she behaved on TV. I was just uh, incredulous that she's worth what people think she's worth because uh, she's a good looking, I, don't, I wouldn't even call her articulate. I mean, I was just really amazed that she sounded like somebody that just graduated from a high school in Ca Southern California, that uh, she was just acting like a sorority girl. I just couldn't believe it. And so um, 
Trump has a lot of work to do, especially with the press, because they can tear down a president. As we know, in the past, if the press doesn't like you, they will go after you like they did after Nixon uh, in the later years, I guess, with Johnson, with, but deservedly so, because he was a war, war criminal. If there was ever a war criminal, it was Lyndon Johnson, given what he did in Vietnam. And um, but, but once Watergate hit, I think the press had the right to probe and to question the president and his key advisors about what happened there. But with Trump, I think his persona is so larger than life, I think the, the media have a hard time relating to that, and therefore they're going after him in a way that I've never seen before in American politics on a very personal level. And this whole thing about this so-called dossier was so over the top. Uh, I think as a private citizen, he could probably sue everyone that was involved in this, especially John McCain, who had the gall to send this to the FBI. He should know better, as someone who's the chairman of the Armed Services Committee, whether this was a legitimate dossier on, on Trump. So John McCain showed his true colors when he uh, took this dossier and sent it to the FBI. He should have thrown it in a wastebasket ba instead of making a big deal out of it. And so it's clear to me that the um, media are out to get him. And as we know, the deep state is out to get him because Trump is challenging the CIA. And that, as Tr Senator Schumer said recently on MSNBC, Trump should be careful in challenging the CIA. Now, is he issuing a warning to Trump that he better cool it or some bad things could happen? Yeah, that is disturbing that we would be in that position where even the president has to beware of an institution that's supposed to be under his authority or the authority of the U.S. government. Yeah, it's That is a crazy situation. I think with the press, it's going to be interesting to see how Trump, frankly, manages his Twitter account after he's president. Is he going to continue to go after these people and make, frankly, make their lives very unpleasant. I mean, Lindsey Graham was made fun of in that press conference, and Trump said, Lindsey will crack that 1% barrier one of these days. I mean, Lindsey Graham gets slammed to the ground every time he goes after Trump. You would think after a while he would just stop doing it. So it'll be interesting to see how he manages the, the, the press for sure. I'm interested in this trade issue. Of course, as a lot of us are, this is something we have to keep an eye on because Trump, we, we all know what his views on trade are. I want to get your thoughts about this because I think in middle America, it plays very well when Trump says, I basically told this company, you better not relocate to Mexico. And all of a sudden, they have promised to, to create 100,000 jobs in America. People are cheering, you know, make America great again. They, they love it. That plays well. Whereas if you say, well, yeah, there's that, but there are many other reasons that indirectly you're going to be impoverished by this. People stop listening to you 33% of the way through that sentence. So how would you reach somebody? I mean, you're, you're, you've been in politics, and somebody asks you a question. How would you say to them that international trade, unfettered international trade, is a good thing for you? And it's not a matter of, well, you're going to lose your job to Chinese people earning a, a buck fifty an hour. Well, I would, I would turn this around and say, what if jobs in Michigan or companies in Michigan went to Mississippi or Alabama or Florida? They're taking jobs away from people in Michigan and Wisconsin and uh, Ohio and Indiana. Should we stop companies from relocating in the United States? So if we shouldn't do that, then why should we stop companies from relocating outside the United States? In other words, if you take any argument that the left has or the interventionists have and you turn it around on them, then you can see the illogic of their argument. International trade is wonderful. In fact, this whole issue of a trade deficit, the way I teach my students about a trade deficit is, how many of you go shopping to your local supermarket? Your family goes and maybe spends $200, $300 a week at your local supermarket. Guess what? The local supermarket doesn't buy anything from your family. You're running a trade deficit with your local supermarket, yet you're happy. They're happy. Everyone's happy. Why? Because you're producing something that you're earning money for that you're then using to buy the things that you want, no matter where it's located. But on the other hand, people will say the difference is that in the U.S., all we're producing is treasuries. And in the long run, there's no way that that's going to work out for us. Well, if you look at international trade, again, I, I haven't done a lot of research in where the money's coming, but look at all the companies that have set up shop in the United States, in, in the southern part of the United States, Honda, Toyota, uh, Kia, BMW. I mean, they're all over 
uh, the southern part of the United States. Why? Because they have much favorable regulations and favorable tax rates compared to the Northeast. So that's one of the reasons that the Northeast is losing jobs to the South and other parts of the world. So again, it's a matter of what factors determine the location of a business or an industry. It has to do all the favorable economic, social, environmental regulations that will, will prevent companies from having a good rate of return in the Northeast. Back in the 1960s, uh, your neck of the woods where you grew up, uh, the textile industry was moving out of the Northeast because of high costs, they were moving down South. And so this is the evolution of, of an economy, whether it's a local economy, a regional economy, a national economy, or an international economy. I mean, the next frontier for investing, according to some people, is Africa, because you have low cost. Uh, if they get their act together and have political and social stability, uh, you have populations that will probably uh, gain skills that will allow them to uh, increase their productivity over the next 100, 150, 200 years. So that's where people will be looking for, just as 40 years ago. Who would have thought China would be the economic powerhouse there today, or South Korea, or um, other parts of uh, the Asian continent? So again, this is an evolutionary process, and we shouldn't be afraid of free enterprise. We shouldn't be afraid of free trade. We shouldn't be afraid of working with companies around the world. What we need are the elements that libertarians and Austrian economists have been talking about for, for a couple of centuries now, 150 years, is you need limited government, you need the rule of law, you need sound money, and you need low taxes. I mean, those are the ingredients that make uh, economies prosper. When you look at the trend in manufacturing employment, it turns out that the so-called job losses are overwhelmingly attributable to increase productivity in manufacturing so that you need fewer people to do the same amount of work, which is what an economy is trying to do. An economy is trying to economize on inputs so that now, okay, now we have labor that is free to do other things. And people will say, oh, but there's nothing for those people to do. Well, just think to yourself, could you, you can't think of something you could hire somebody to do if, if there were uh, available labor. The more we're able to produce the lower the, the prices of those things will be, the more your your uh, paycheck will, will extend, and the more we'll be able to demand many other things and many other services. But it, it seems like this whole thing about we've got to bring jobs back from China, you're trying to bring back a very small number of jobs that even, again, given the trend toward automation, even these jobs are going to be very temporary. Much better to try to adjust to the world we live in and, and, and also – how about the fact that in our government-run schools, nobody is taught, why don't you figure out what your niche is or what you should specialize in so that when you get out of here, you have some clue what to do. No, no kid has any idea what to do when he gets out of high school other than to go to college for four years and then after that have no idea what to do after that. They do a terrible job of that, and nobody mentions that. All right, we got plenty more to talk about. Let's first thank our sponsor. Folks, if you remember the Pink Floyd album, Dark Side of the Moon, it was all about different things that can drive you mad. Well, one of those things in my case is email. You can't imagine how much email I get every day, and it takes over my life, and it makes me anxious, and how am I going to answer it all, and how do I sort through it? And I now have the solution thanks to SaneBox.com, S-A-N-E-B-O-X.com. It sorts my email according to how important it is. That's right. It figures that out. Now, I nudge it along. I give it some hints here and there, and it also can have my email come back to me on a particular day when I know I'll have time to deal with it. So instead of thinking, oh, i got to go back and look at my email from five days ago to get to those three I didn't answer, no, I can just tell Sanebox, send me these tomorrow or send them to me two days from now at 3 p.m. because I know I'll be available then. It has those tools and more. I can't recommend it enough. Get a two-week free trial plus an automatic $25 discount if you decide to subscribe by checking out sanebox.com slash woods. All right, let's get back to Trump here. He did say at one point something like he wants to have some rule whereby for every new regulation that's added, two will be repealed. That's a great idea, but that sounds to me like the typical Republican Party talking point that makes you know Murray Sabrin and me happy. But then they never actually do it. But at the same time, I do think there is the likelihood of some reasonable regulatory relief. But I don't know what form it's going to take or how much of it there will be. But if we get that, I would say that that's certainly a net plus. Have you heard anything about what might happen in this area? 
I haven't followed that too closely, but there's a bigger picture here, that namely, speak to the people in business. Trump is the quintessential CEO. He, he deals with regulation as a real estate developer constantly. He should call in people from various industries, whether it's banking, big pharma, uh, let's see, labor relations. Uh, just go down the list of all the type of regulations that the federal government imposes on business and say, what can we do to get us toward a free market and deregulation? What are the things that we need to do that sound reasonable but are unnecessary for business to be productive? And if we did that within six months to a year, we could probably deregulate most of the U.S. economy. Look what happened to Jimmy Carter, our Democrat. He brought in Alfred Kahn, the economist from Cornell, and they deregulated every major industry in the late 70s. And the Reagan administration or the Reagan economy in the 1980s was a beneficiary of that, whether it's telecommunications, trucking, airlines, everything was deregulated. And guess what? Deregulation increases competition, increased competition, lowest prices. That means higher living standards for the people. It's a simple formula. You don't need to go further than that to say, what are the things that are holding back or raising costs in different sectors of the economy? And let's get rid of them. Lock, stock, and barrel. Trump could do that within the first six months of his uh, presidency, and the economy would get a big lift of that. You'd get more productivity out of workers. You'd get lower prices in different sectors. And the economy would grow faster than it has been under the, the so-called Obama uh, expansion, which was the, the most tepid in the post-war period. So there's a lot Trump can do on the regulatory side without the need to, st quote, stimulate the economy with this phony monetary policy and more government spending. Over lunch just now, we were talking about what's likely to happen in the economy over the next few years and that there are some possible dangers there you could have a, a bubble bursting and we were saying that of course it would be best if if this is going to happen from trump's point of view if this is going to happen during his watch it would be best for it to happen as soon as possible just like under reagan in his first term you get rid of it you clear it out and you try and rebuild on a sound foundation by the time the next election comes along whereas you were saying you think it's more likely for this to carry on for another year or two then actually get bad closer to when it comes time for him to run for re-election, and then everything becomes quite complicated. Yeah, I look at some financial indicators which currently indicate that uh, we're still in the boom phase of the business cycle. Um, interest rates are still relatively low. One of the things that's a good predictor of, um, of the um, beginning of a recession is an inverted yield curve, and we still have very low short-term rates. The other thing is a stock market indicator I follow. So when the stock market starts to roll over below a 10-month moving average, and this is you can find that on dshort.com website. It's a great website with a lot of uh, charts and tables about uh, financial and economic indicators. And there's one more that totally escaped me, which I uh, don't have in front of me. But those are two that are, that are really important in terms of where the economy is going six months, a year down the road. And if we go back and look at what happened in 2007, 2008, we saw the the stock market started rolling over in uh, late 2007 and into 2008. The yield curve started inverting, and this was the perfect storm of the signaling because the Fed was tightening up monetary policy because it was afraid that of uh, the the boom getting out of hand. So we've seen this twice in the last 25 years with the dot com bubble and the housing bubble, and we're now in the third bubble. The biggest bubble we have, by the way, is the bond bubble. We've seen bond prices go through the roof, interest rates go down for for 35 years. Some people think that we've reached the bottom in interest rates, that the long-term bond will start going up, as will short-term rates, and that will begin the, uh, the countdown to when the next recession hits, which probably will be in 2018, 2019. And no one can predict this in advance, but those are the indicators that I look for as guideposts as to how Fed monetary policy is going to affect the economy. And um, uh, Robert Wenzel at, at Economic Policy Journal, he shows that the um, money supply growth has been pretty strong. So you don't get a recession when the money supply growth is strong. So when that starts to decelerate and maybe even goes negative, that's a good sign that we're going to see a recession and the stock market peaking. I want to say something about New Jersey politics, because a lot of people might think that's of interest only to people who live in New Jersey. But New Jersey has an outsized uh, influence, let's say. I mean, for example, Chris Christie was, even though he didn't poll very well in the presidential race, he was a significant figure in coming out 
and supporting Donald Trump at a time when the GOP establishment was not endorsing Donald Trump. I was a little surprised that after he stuck his neck out and did that, he wound up not getting anything out of Trump. So I'm curious to, to get your thoughts as to why that might have happened. And then secondly, how would New Jersey politics fit into Trump's overall strategy in the future? Just the other day, a, a judge in New Jersey uh, said that uh, there's a private lawsuit against Chris Christie for acting um, irresponsibly in this Bridgegate affair where they had this uh, so-called traffic study that tied up traffic in Fort Lee, which is not far from my co-op. So I saw this firsthand of the mess that was created by this uh, tr uh, so-called uh, traffic study. So there's a lawsuit going ahead, and we'll see if what happens there. But uh, Chris Christie had an opportunity when he was elected in 2009 and re-elected in a landslide in 2013 to change the political culture in New Jersey. Unfortunately, he didn't do that. Again, he's, he's in another example of, of a politician whose persona overshadows any substantive political ideas he has. Because I've spoken to him in 2009, he really doesn't have any core political uh, beliefs or economic beliefs. In fact, in his State of the State address uh, last week, he talked about how the state of New Jersey has to get more involved in helping drug addicts uh, uh, kick their habit. Well, that's all well and good, but that's not the responsibility of government is to help people kick their habits. That's why we have organizations like Alcoholics Anonymous and other, and other, and other nonprofit organizations that help people cope with their personal problems. And the, the other thing Christie wants to do is he wants to mandate insurance companies paying for drug addiction uh, programs. Again, using mandates, coercion of the state to solve a major problem. However, I think uh, Chris Christie didn't get anything because of the Bridgegate situation in New Jersey. Uh, his son-in-law, Jared Kushner's father, was uh, uh, prosecuted by, by Chris Christie when he was a U.S. attorney. So that doesn't sit well with uh, Jared Kushner. So I think that was a factor in um, Christie being pushed aside. And uh, I think Christie wants, wants to have the stage for himself. He's not a team player from what I can see. He, um, he said he wouldn't take the vice presidency because uh, how would I be able to function as a vice president? He likes the limelight. Having said that, there's a governor's race in New Jersey this year. One of only two, New, New Jersey and Virginia, have governor's races in off years. And I uh, emailed Kellyanne Conway saying Donald Trump should get behind one of the first state legislators in the country to endorse Donald Trump. And that was Senator Mike Doherty, who, by the way, endorsed Ron Paul for president twice in 2008 and 2012, who's probably the most fiscal conservative in the state of New Jersey. And I said, if Donald wants to have a national movement of clearing the swamp, of draining the swamp, he can start in New Jersey at the statewide level in 2017 by getting behind uh, Senator Doherty. And that would help not only the uh, movement, it would help the GOP in the state of New Jersey because history is against the Republicans keeping the governor's uh, office because in New Jersey, we seem to go back eight years of Republican, eight years of Democrats, and history is against the Republicans keeping the, the governor's race, uh, governor's seat this year. The only one I think that can have a real shot at, at being uh, a Republican governor for, for a third consecutive uh, uh, term would be Mike Doherty because he's a strong fiscal conservative. He's strong on the Second Amendment. He's pro-life. He He's opposed to crony capitalism. Le how do you say that term? Lock, stock, and barrel? Hey. He is really uh, as close to a libertarian within the Republican Party, someone who deeply believes in individual liberty and uh, personal responsibility. I want you to tell us a little something about the project you're working on on your sabbatical because it would obviously be of interest to people who listen to this. On my blogs, uh, starting uh, uh, this week, I will be posting uh, the uh, sort of a diary of what I'm doing. My, my sabbatical is going to be looking at the two bubbles that we've had, the dot-com bubble and the housing bubble, and see what the mainstream economists said, the Keynesians, the uh, Austrians, the supply starters, the monetarists, and see who had the best analysis during the past 20 years. So I'll be doing that project uh, from now till uh, June. And then I have another project, which I'm really excited about, because I think this could have an impact on policy in the United States. It's called, the book is called, the Next Revolution, Personal Social Responsibility 
and financial independence. That, I think, is the essence of what America is all about, that people take responsibility for their actions, they become financially independent as adults, and we don't need a welfare state. We have a nonprofit sector, a vibrant nonprofit sector in the United States that helps people cope with problems. And if we have a, a, a robust private sector, a nonprofit sector, and a government that protects people's rights, we will achieve what I think the founders envisioned for the country, a free and prosperous America, instead of this incredible welfare warfare state that's really draining the lifeblood out of the economy. But the good news is that there's still enough free enterprise in this economy. As Warren Buffett has pointed out, the economy has grown for 230 years, but with fits and starts and sometimes terrible situations like the Great Recession, the Great Depression, which is very painful. If you have to go through a period of three, four, five years without a job or losing your business and losing your house, that is painful. So at the federal level, we have to get back to sound money. Ron Paul's movement is all about that. The libertarian movement is all about that. If we have all these things in place over the next five years, the 21st century could be one of the most incredible centuries in the history of the human race when we return to the principles that helped guide the founders to create this country in the first place. So I'm excited about getting involved with these projects and having an impact on the public discussion. And uh, you never know, what you do will have a long-lasting impact because I just uh, turned a, had a birthday milestone last month, and you want to leave a certain legacy behind as to what you've accomplished to make uh, the, the country a little bit better than um, uh, you, you saw, had, saw it in the first place. Well, these are great projects, very worthy, and I'm glad you you have the time to do them. Tell us, the is, is your website, well, actually, you tell us the website. The website is murraysabrin.com. That's M-U-R-R-A-Y-S-A-B-R-I-N.com. And I'll be posting probably a, a nightly log of what I've done every single day on this uh, sabbatical because it's an exciting project of looking backwards and saying, hey, what did all these supposedly smart people say about the economy? What did they were what were they saying in real time as the economy was unfolding? And what did they uh, get right? What did they get wrong? And just have a a discussion about what is the best way to understand how the economy unfolds. And I think uh, everyone knows where I'm coming from. I think the Austrians were very good in the 1990s, talking about the dot-com bubble and the housing bubble. There's a, a vast literature by Austrians. But what did the Keynesians, the monetarists, the supply starters to say also that, uh, that uh, was consistent with good economic financial analysis as opposed to just pontificating about, uh, about the economy? Well, we'll look forward to those. And in fact, I'll have to have you back on to talk about the your findings in the current project that you're working on now. Uh, thanks a lot. It's been fun seeing you today, and I appreciate you doing this. Thanks, Tom. It's always a pleasure. And congratulations on uh, being one of the great pillars of the uh, liberty movement. Um, I, I hope that uh, people uh, listen to your show far and wide because uh, the guests that you bring on have so much uh, insight into what's happening in our country and around the world that uh, if enough people listened, I think we'd have a major change in this country. All right, everybody, that'll do it for today, except I do want to tell you about a brand new website created by yet another listener of the show, and it's called etinvisibilium.com. I'm not going to insult your intelligence by spelling out et invisibilium.com because I'm sure you are all knowledgeable in Latin. And also, if you're not, you can always just go to tomwoods.com slash 826 and you'll see this site linked as the listener website mentioned. It's a blog about economics, of course, and et invisibilium is a reference in this case to what is unseen, the old Frederick Bastiat distinction between what is seen and what is unseen. The government bills a bridge with taxpayer money. The bridge is what is seen. What would have been built with that money had the government not spent it on a bridge is what is not seen. And by neglecting what is not seen, we make a lot of really, really bad policy. And that's really what this site is looking to uncover, all the unseen. Of course, we can't know necessarily what we would have had otherwise, but we can know that we are missing something. And this helps us to understand better what the correct way forward is. So I urge you to check out etinvisibilium.com. Again, I'm looking to it at tomwoods.com slash 826 as the listener website mentioned. Remember, you can get a nice shout out like this for your brand new site, plus a link on my site, which really helps you in the search engines, plus 24 video tutorials, if you like, to help you get started as a blogger and membership in my exclusive private 
bloggers group where you can get your questions answered and be in a nice group of uh, good folks who are doing the same thing you're doing. These are great bonuses. You get them by checking out tomwoods.com slash publicity before you grab your web hosting. All right, tomorrow, libertarian comedian Andrew Heaton joins me. See you then. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time.